Okay, well, welcome everyone to the penultimate meeting of the uh, CDAR seminar. I'm Lisa Bolger, CDAR's co director, and it is my pleasure, and also I have to say I have some trepidation here, of introducing my competitor, former colleague, old friend, and current competitor, Ben Davis, talking about uh, a subject that's of gro huge growing importance, lost harvesting. In public equities, are you speaking strictly about? Yeah, in public equities, which was was a sleeper topic for decades, and now all of a sudden it's exploding. So, uh, Ben, please go for it. Okay, all right. Well, thank thank you, Lisa, for the invitation to speak. It's really nice to be back at Berkeley. Um, I have a I, I went here as a student for many years, and um, it's just very nice to be back in the building. Um, and as Lisa's alluding to, I'm currently. Um, in a research group at, at Parametric, which is headquartered in Seattle. So if you ever come up to Seattle, send me a, a reach out to me and we'll have coffee. Um, okay, yeah. So tax loss harvesting optionality. So um, as, as Lisa was saying, ta tax loss harvesting is something of practical importance. And there's a lot of uh, firms that, that either do this or want to do this. Um, in terms of understanding, I'll talk a little bit about tax loss harvesting for people that don't know what it is. But I will just say that most of the work in tax loss harvesting in terms of um, uh, trying to understand qualitatively how it behaves, most of that's very, very heavily dependent on, on simulations, either Monte Carlo simulations or historical simulations. Um, and so there's a number of different phenomena that is sort of like mechanisms and then get a conceptual understanding of the of the performance of tax loss harvesting has kind of been a little bit hard to come by. So the purpose of this talk is not to introduce a, a result of practical importance in tax loss harvesting, but it's just to sort of make a top line point that uh, just to remind people there is optionality in tax loss harvesting, and because there's optionality, um, th there's certain implications of, of, of just the optionality, um, and they might be totally obvious if you're not thinking, oh, optionality is there. Um, okay, so. Um, this is just uh, for folks who don't know what tax loss harvesting is. Uh, I want to talk about something that's probably sounds pretty dry: capital gains taxes. Um, um, but actually, is the reason why uh, tax loss harvesting is important. So, investors, uh, taxable investors in the U.S. are subject to capital gains taxes. So, um, what does that mean? It means if they make an investment in an asset, the price of the asset goes up. That's an unrealized gain. Um, if they then sell the asset that for a profit, that's a realized gain, and they have to pay a tax on that realized gain. So in reality, the tax depends on um, how long they held the asset before selling it. So there's a short-term tax, I'll just call, call it 40%, 40 40%, there's a, there's a long-term tax, which is less. I'm not really going to focus on the difference between short-term and long-term taxes in this presentation, but just know if you have a gain, uh, it's subject to a tax. Um, so that's the bad news. The good news is um, gains are offset by losses. So if you make, if you realize a gain of $10,000 on investments in a year, but you have a different investment that you sell at a loss for $10,000, then you don't owe any tax. Again, long, neglecting this whole issue of short-term versus long-term. So you can kind of, um, you can accumulate credits on losses. And hence this idea of, quote, harvesting losses. So you realize losses, you can use that to offset capital gains taxes you might have, you might have realized from other trades that you did or other parts of your portfolio. Um, so in this talk, I'm just going to assume that you have a large portfolio. Maybe you have some allocations to, um, to active managers, and hopefully those active managers actually are generating realized gains from you from your trading, and you need to mitigate, you would like to mitigate those taxes. So how are you going to do that? You have a different part of your portfolio, and you're going to um, you know, inevitably, any portfolio, some stuff's up, some stuff's down, and you can realize uh, losses in the, in the stuff that's down in order to offset those gains. So here's a very simple example. And normally, I wouldn't go through it in so much detail, but I think it's important to understand how the optionality aspect. So um, just very quickly, um, let's suppose that you buy 245 shares of SPY. SPY is an ETF on the S&P 500, and you pay a price of $600 a share for those shares. That's actually how I think SPY is at like $400 a share right now. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that means that you you paid $147,000 for your portfolio, and that number, $147,000, in tax language, that's called your cost basis. It's how much you paid for your portfolio. 
Okay, so great. So you, you invest 140000 dollars And let's just suppose that you're a bit unlucky and SPY falls 8.33% to and now I'm just gonna secure my machine. It snooze. Very good. All right. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna suppose that SPY falls to five hundred and fifty dollars a share, so it falls fifty dollars a share, and now your portfolio market value is one hundred and thirty-four thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, so you lost some money. How much did you lose? You have an unrealized loss as long as you still hold the shares of twelve thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. So market value minus your cost basis. And so what you could do if you want, you could just hold the shares. It's funny, you, you hold the shares, you still lost the money, and that's how much the shares are worth, or you can sell the shares and, and, and receive cash in payment, in which case you have a realized, I'm going to call it here, a short-term capital loss. Let's say you let's say you sold the shares three months after you bought them, a realized capital loss of $12,250. Okay, so the nice part, is, you know, you feel bad you lost $12,000, but you feel good if you have capital gains elsewhere in your portfolio. So in this bottom table, I just say, okay, so I had $20,000 of capital gains elsewhere in my portfolio, would have paid uh, short-term, let's call it the short-term capital gains, a tax of $8,160. But because I realized these losses on SPY at $12,000, I saved $5,000 of that tax bill. I shave off $5,000. Okay, so, so that's the mechanics of how this works. So um, if, uh, you know, if we were like 40 people in the room and who uh, I would say, oh, does anybody have any questions? We'd probably talk about this for a while longer, but uh, so there's five people I can say, does anybody have any questions about that? No, okay. The important thing I wanna emphasize here is this bottom bullet point, which is, and this, uh, this phrasing is important. Investors have the right, but not the obligation to sell assets held at a loss, re resulting in valuable tax credits. So this phrase should resonate with anybody who's read about options. Because the whole idea of options is that you have the right, but not the obligation to do something um, that where there's a financial value attached to it. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. Okay, so my claim is that this right, but not the obligation to sell those SPY shares is equivalent to what's called a put um, in sort of in classical options theory, a financial put. And um, I went so far as to make this slide to show you exactly that it's exactly equivalent in terms of the um, payoff to a put. So uh, anybody who studies options is very familiar with this picture. This is the classic put exercise payoff. Um, and uh, ignore the uh, axis on the top for a second, just focus on the axis at the bottom, which is the usual axis. So here, what I've got is, I've got, uh, I've got a put on 100 shares of the S&P 500 ETF. So 100 shares, that's actually typical for a put. And I'm gonna say that the strike price is $600 a share. And what I've got here is the exercise payoff on the y-axis of exercising the put, and then just add the market value of the underlying uh, ETF shares varies. So if you own 100 shares, $600 a share, you've got market value $60,000. And then suppose the market value drops to $55,000. All right, so what does that mean? It means you can buy shares at 55, uh, worth $55,000 and then you can sell them for $60,000 resulting in a profit of $5,000. That's your, that's your quick payoff. Yeah. Doesn't this require something extra from regular old option theory? Like you gotta have gains that require offsetting? You have to have gains that require offsetting. So I'm gonna assume for this, for this lecture that that might, that all losses, yes, that there are available gains, that there's a reservoir of gains and that can offset. Who has those gains? Like everybody? It's not relevant for this talk. So this is a purely theoretical talk of making a connection to optionality. Okay. Uh, but but yes, you, you're right. In reality, the different investors may or may not have available gains. Yeah. Um, okay. So so that's the put exercise payoff on a, a, a plot for 100 shares of the ETF. Um, if you look at the axis at the top that I told you to ignore, um, this axis is actually in terms of the value of the 245 shares of the S&P 500 ETF. So here, K is your cost basis, which is $600 a share. And this is actually how the market value of this ETF varies along the top exactly as the value of these 100 shares underlying there on the bottom. 
And so if you remember back from the previous slide, oh, when the price falls from $600 a share to $550 a share, I could save $5,000 on my taxes, assuming I have enough real, uh, realized gains. And uh, here, that's exactly the amount that actually I would realize I'm put on 100 shares. So why 100 shares instead of 245 shares? It's just because the tax rate is only 40.8%. So I just have to scale the notional by 40.8% to get the, the notional for the put. Okay, so let me just stop there. So literally, at least as far as this uh, payoff, um, either the loss harvesting or the put exercise payoff, they're exactly equivalent in terms of payoffs. Okay, great. So anytime you have an option, yeah. In the previous figure, if the price went to 65,000, shouldn't you be like losing um, money? That is an excellent point. So with a, with a standard financial put, if the price goes up, you just don't exercise the put. And that's why that's why you, you have zero. Same thing on the, on the tax side, and this is a very good point. So on the tax side, if the price goes up, you could sell the position and realize a gain, or you could so-called defer the gain, which just means you just hold the position, you don't sell it. And now you don't have a tax liability. So that's, that's a really good point. So the IRS does not tax people on unrealized gains, uh, US investors. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Okay. So um, anytime people start thinking about options, they want to know, well, I got my option or I maybe I've got a basket of options. What's a good, when, when should I exercise them and when should I just continue to hold the options? So that question is called the question of uh, optimal option exercise. And there's been, you know, depending on the option, the optimal way to exercise or the optimal policy to exercise um, can vary. And, the, and I just want to point out right now, um, there's a, an option that feels very similar to what we have here, so so-called perpetual American put. So probably uh, most people are, are familiar with the American versus European. The idea with an American put, you can exercise it at any time. You don't have to wait for a designated date. Um, for loss harvesting, I could choose to liquidate any moment intraday or to sell the position now. I could realize my losses. So I do have an American style put. And perpetual means that there's no, this is the sort of the unusual part where you start to get a little bit off the beaten track. There's no expiry date. So you can imagine just having a put where you're just like, yeah, I, I just have this forever and I can choose to exercise it whenever I want. So it turns out that for perpetual American put, this is a known uh, analyzed option that you can look in, in whole options, futures and derivatives, and you can get the, um, the so-called optimal policy, assuming that you know you're in continuous time, you have lock number of returns, and you have a risk-free rate, blah blah blah, and uh, it will tell you. Oh, if you tell me the uh, strike price of the put, I'll have, here's the optimal policy: sell once the price falls sufficiently far below the strike price, and how far uh, this far. So it's a very simple formula in terms of the risk-free rate R, but also the volatility of the underlier. Um, so that's the volatility um, sigma. So that's the key points I want to emphasize here. So for this option, first of all, the optimal policy is um, so-called trigger-based policy, a loss depth trigger base. You wait until the losses are at a certain level, and then you exercise. Okay. And, I, and although it's not printed on the slide, I want to emphasize the optimal not, and you might think, why would it be this? It's not wait a month and then exercise it. It's not exercise it after 12 months goes by. It's not, you know, I, I, just wait one day and then exercise it. Almost the way I've set it up, that would be totally nonsensical. Why, why would that make any sense? But I just want to point that out. So it's based on this trigger. And then second of all, there's a simple analytical formula. That's very nice. It can be proved mathematically. I'm not going to do that here. Um, and here's the key point. The trigger price actually depends on the stock volatility. So you can see I wrote the formula there. And in particular, when the volatility goes up, the trigger depth goes down. So for a more volatile ETF or a more volatile stock, you would want to wait to see deeper losses before, before exercising the put. Um, and for a less volatile stock, you would, you, you know, the losses don't have to be as deep before you exercise. Can I ask a question? Um, so um, I, you're assuming, I think, that the uh, capital gains you're trying to offset, they're fixed, they're exogenous to this model. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I think Lisa already mentioned this. So I'm just going to assume 
uh, in, in this talk that there's basically, there's just an infinite, there's an endless supply of capital gains that you're looking to offset. That's not yeah. realistic, obviously, but nevertheless, that's just to make things my life simple. That's what I'm going to assume that. Well, yeah, that okay. So, so the, the reason I was asking the question is that um, this is perpetual, but there's also a, an option on capital gains, which is to exercise and pay the tax or to die. Um, and at which point there's no, no no capital gains tax, and um, uh, so that that actually is an option when you're thinking about um, you know leaving assets to um, to heirs or to charity. Um, yeah, you're absolutely but, right. So I, that has a name. I believe it's called um, borrow by die is the strategy. Um, yep. And uh, no, that that's a good point. And so that's a. Uh, that's that's a nuance again. That's going to be outside the model that I that I consider here. But that's a very good point. Um, here, this is just a perpetual American put. So this actually, you know, this just as a financial option has nothing to do with uh, loss harvesting, except for oh, it sort of feels very similar to to yeah. to this payoff. That that's a great point, Bob. Sort of, and yeah. exactly the same people who I think have these unlimited capital gains are the ones who are likely to be able to die at the good moment and pass everything on. Same group. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think the approximation is, you know, very good for someone who's, uh, you know, middle age or you know, a, a young senior. It may be less good for somebody who's in their their eighties. But you know, the the option of whether to ex exercise the gain in the first place or not may be a real one. But anyway, uh, I don't I don't want to divert you further on this. Thanks. <laughs> These are, all, these are all great points. So, so I think there's a lot of, uh, in reality, there's there's sort of several deviations from this very uh, stylized presentation I'm presenting here. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. So, oh, my last point. Uh, so, the tax loss harvesting option is actually more exotic than just a, a vanilla perpetual American foot for the reason that I'm going to show on the next slide. And so, here's the reason why tax loss harvesting actually isn't just this perpetual American foot. Um, uh, it has, it's because of this IRS wash sale rule. Okay, so this is kind of a funny name. It's always seems funny to me, but um, what the IRS uh, wash sale rule says, it's here in italics, a wash sale occurs when you sell a security at a loss and within 30 days before or after the sale, you buy substantially identical stock or securities. So what does that mean? It means you sold all 245 of your ETF shares and then maybe the next day or 15 minutes later, you just buy them all back. Okay, that's considered a, wa a wash sale. I guess there's an expression, an expression, that's a wash, meaning it's like it didn't really happen. Um, so uh, in particular, when a security sold at a loss, in order to gain the deduction, you actually have to wait 30 calendar days before buying it back. Okay, so that's actually introduces a big, a big um, deviation. That's a very important aspect, actually, of this tax loss harvesting option. Um, as we'll see, and that's kind of the point of this lecture is to kind of argue that um, this this is really critical for the optimal exercise of the option. Um, okay, um, uh, two authors, Israel Lab and Lou, um, last year, I think this is just on SSRN, um, they argue that the IRS wash sale rule creates a barrier to reinvestment, so you, you can't just buy back the security, the underlying securities immediately, such that investors should be selective about when to harvest at a loss. In other words, the optimal policy, they argue that the optimal policy is not just, oh, the second you see any kind of loss, just sell the securities immediately and realize the loss. You should be more selective. And how selective, how should you make this decision? Um, in their paper, they present a trigger-based loss harvesting policy based on loss depth. Of, they're similar to the American quote we just saw, um, where the depth is determined by the stock volatility. They, they, they support their sort of argument here and their choice of loss depth by extensive Monte Carlo simulation. So they just basically do a bunch of simulations and they're sort of like arguing simulation. We can sort of choose a, we can choose a, a trigger depth. Their simulations, the goal of their simulations is to have a, um, although still a, a stylized process, sort of a process that, that reflects the actual sort of um, higher moments that you really see in the stock market. Because I, I think they were sort of trying to pick maybe a realistic loss depth. We're not going to go that direction here. We're more concerned about kind of analytical tractability. So that's the point of this talk. We're going to kind of extend this line of reasoning. We're going to use stochastic process theory to sort of prove that a trigger-based policy is optimal 
for a very stylized continuous time model of tax loss harvesting, where the underlier falls, you know, sort of the standard assumption, log normal returns uh, with mean zero. Um, and I'm sure you could you could adjust uh, certainly the mean um, and, and improve our results. But anyway, that's what we're going to look at. So, so uh, can I ask one more yeah. question? Uh, so, so I don't think it's that hard in practice to avoid the wash sales rule. Uh, it's a question of what's substantially identical. So if you sold uh, an S&P 500 ETF and bought a Russell 3000 ETF, I think you, you're not caught by it. Um, I'm fairly sure about that. Um, and you know, maybe even if you bought somebody else's S&P 500 ETF, I mean, that there, I, I don't know what the IRS does, but um, I, I wonder in practice how serious a subjection is. It's not really an objection. So I, I should say the goal of the, so let me actually talk about a little bit about how people have talked about this before. The typical assumption in virtually every study is the existence of perfect substitutes, absolutely perfect substitutes. That's a typical assumption. And, and essentially uh, nullifying the IRS wash so for the reason, like basically assuming away the existence of the wash so uh, what I'm what what Israel Adamu do, and what I'm going to assume here is I'm going to kind of take like the exact opposite extreme position, which is that uh, there's no substitute whatsoever, and that you're forced to hold cash. That's that's a very extreme position, and I think that's kind of what you're getting at. In reality, there's kind of like a gray zone about what you want to substitute. And if you're doing a single security, you can you know. You can hire a law firm and they can sort of advise you on how much overlap there could be between the underlying universes, between the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000 or whatever it is. And you could sort of get a, get a sense of, of what the, you know, how close the substitute in reality that, that you could get. What I'm really trying to do here though is make more of a conceptual point for managers that are managing in such a way that they're trying to steer clear of the wash sale rule. The idea here is that for, for risk reasons, there's some barrier. There's basically, there is a barrier to reinvestment. They're, they can't do perfect substitution. And so for risk reasons, once they use the, do the trade, they are more constrained. There, there is an additional barrier to reinvestment or an additional barrier to further loss harvesting. And really the point of this lecture is to create a stylized example and say, in the presence of, of such a barrier, here a very extreme barrier, is there, is there a, uh, what would the optimal exercise policy look like? So the argument here is, yeah, conceptually, any barrier whatsoever should produce some type of trigger. And, and you, there isn't just a, a uh, you know, the high, highest frequency trading imaginable is what you should do. That, that's kind of the, the overall conceptual point that, that I'm trying to make here. Um, anyway, we can come back to it. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, the stylized model that we'll consider here is uh, an ETF that pays no dividends. Um, again, this is a very simple model. So again, we're going to assume the price exhibits geometric branding motion. Uh, when you take the log returns, we're going to assume they're mean zero. We're going to assume that uh, they're log normal. Um, this is just some plots of some various paths that you get here, starting with a share price of one dollar. Sure, this is very familiar to a lot of people. Uh, here, I use thirty percent annualized volatility. That's actually very high for an ETF. Um, originally, when I the, the Israel Law and Lou paper actually talks about single name stocks, not ETFs. Um, and so, thirty percent volatility may be more more realistic for certain stocks. Uh, I just I wanted to sort of compare what I was getting with what they have in their papers, so that's why I use thirty percent. Uh, if I were to rewrite this presentation, I would use a lower volatility that's more, more reflective of actual ETF volatility. But anyway, that's that's not really a problem. And um, here, uh, to sort of approximate continuous time, I've done 100 ticks per day uh, over a year. So that's just an approximation of continuous time for the purposes of, of this plot. And you might notice the x-axis stops at 250, actually stops at 252. Many people are aware there's 252 trading days in a year. So there's just 252 days in a year for things. Um, okay, so so what's the investment process that we that we are going to model here in this talk? Uh, we're going to just set a, a trigger price, and we're going to sell when we hit the trigger price. 
We're going to hold cash. Again, we're going to basically take this extreme position that there's no substitute securities. We're going to hold cash during the wash sale period. So the calendar month or 21 trading days. And then at the end of which we're going to reinvest 100% back in the ETF. So, so that's the that's the stylized model here. And this is an example. This plot shows you an example of a history of one of these simulated portfolios. So in blue, we kind of have this share price, this geometric branding motion. And we're just showing you the, actually the close prices every day here. Um, in orange, we show you the portfolio market value over time. And original, and it's right on top of the, we just assume you buy one share initially. So they're right on top and then later they, they deviate. And then the green line is the portfolio cost basis. So that's, again, that's just however much you paid for the portfolio. So until you sell, that's just a flat line. So it starts out paying $1 for one share. And then once you sell, maybe you sell at 99 cents, your cost basis would move down to 99 cents. It's debatable whether or not you call a cash position of 99 cents a cost basis or not. Um, so, um, but then you reinvest, you have 99 cents to reinvest. So that'll be the cost basis when you reinvest. Um, so what you'll see for these paths is, I mean, one thing that happens is the share price could just go up above a dollar a share, in which case your cost basis would sit there at a dollar. That's certainly possible. Um, in this path here, the share price um, actually goes down over time. And so we actually have multiple um, opportunities to sell. Here we set a 5% loss period. Every time the, the uh, unrealized losses exceed 5%, we sell. And so that's, that's where the, stair, the step down is occurring the cost basis. Um, okay, so that's our stylized model. Um, and again, we can pose this question, oh, in this stylized model, where there's a huge barrier to reinvestment, uh, is there an optimal choice for the trigger? In other words, maybe it's 5%, maybe that's absolutely optimal. Um, on this slide, this is actually, um, this is just if you want to know the mechanics of doing a simulation like this. I think I'm just going to skip this slide for the talk, but it just shows day by day the stock return, kind of monitoring the cost basis, looking at the unrealized losses. Here, in an example on day 82, uh, the portfolio unrealized losses are more than 7%. So that would be the day we would exceed the 5% threshold and sell the position. Then we would have to wait 21 days. That's what these little dots are. This is waiting 21 days. And you can see during that period in uh, orange, you can see the portfolio value and the cost basis sit there at about 92 cents because they're just in cash. Um, and then when we reinvest, and this is the part where it may be getting a little bit confusing. We, when we reinvest, our cost basis is 92 cents because that's all we have to invest. Even though the share price could be whatever, share price could be $100 a share, it doesn't matter. You, you know, if you have fractional shares, like, oh, 92 cents. Or maybe it's a penny stock. You buy 92 shares. Um, okay, cool. So, all right, so what are we going to do with this? Well, um, we're going to consider the distribution of simulated. Um, realized loss histories. So we just kind of do this as a classic kind of, I'm thinking about maybe doing Monte Carlo simulation here, but if you want, uh, you know, you do this over and over again. And every time you, you run this experiment, you'll get a different sequence of uh, stock price histories and hence a different sequence of one of these stair step paths of your portfolio cost basis. So here I've plotted, I don't know, hundred of them, but maybe 10,000 of them or just a full distribution everything that could possibly happen. Um, and uh, it's actually convenient uh, to make the problem mathematically tractable to consider not the losses, but the log losses instead. It turns out that makes the, the, a little, uh, the problem a little easier. And so you can see when you do log losses, uh, every step is identical in depth. So it's just it's a constant step down every time you hit the trigger and decide to, um, to realize the losses. Uh, okay, so you've got all those you know, uh, thousands or millions of, of possible paths of, of portfolio history. And then at any given elapsed time, you can compute uh, the expected value and that's the heavy black line. So for any choice of loss trigger, you can do this, you can figure out, oh yeah, here's the expected uh, losses at time T, expected log losses at time T. So um, the nice part, um, I think in this setup, as stylized as it is, and it is very stylized, uh, there's actually an analytical formula for this heavy black line. Um, so, so that's, that's pretty neat. 
Um, we'll, we'll get to that analytical formula a little bit. Um, so with that analytical formula in hand, you can pick any trigger you like, and you can get an estimate for whatever your expected log losses are at any given elapsed time. So here's actually a plot for three different trigger depths. So in the, the previous slide, it was a 5% trigger depth. Here's three different trigger depths, a 3.5% loss trigger, a 7.5% loss trigger, and a 14% loss trigger. And so what you can see is, oh yeah, some triggers actually do uh, accumulate realized losses in expectation more rapidly than others. And in particular here, among these three, uh, uh, if you go out far enough in the plot, the 7.5% trigger accumulates losses more rapidly than either the shallower 3.5% trigger or the deeper 14% trigger. Something else that's kind of interesting and notable about this plot, there's this funny little uh, kind of kink over here early on um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but that's definitely related to the length of the wash sale period. So this, all this business occurs in this sort of sub-21 day regime. And at least I don't know if you, you have a comment about this, but yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. So there's some funny funny monkey business that, that occurs there, and um, it's kind of a sideline. Okay. So, uh, uh, okay, great. So I, it's very natural to ask. Oh, uh, could I pick a different trigger depth that would be even better than this orange plot? Um, so, uh, you know, one thing you can do is you can just try generating those plots with different trigger depths and just look, oh, on day 252, what's the expected log loss? I have a formula for it. So actually, I can compute this entire curve. I can have an analytical formula. And using numerical methods, this is, this is kind of important, you can identify, you can find this orange dot at the bottom of the curve as precisely as you want. Um, this actually, this kind of highlights the importance of having the analytical formula. If you computed every single point on here using Monte Carlo simulation, it would be much more difficult to identify exactly where this dot is because you actually need tens of thousands of paths and you're still gonna see sampling error on this path. And so there's still going to be some uncertainty really about where the location of that orange dot is. So the analytical formula is very helpful in terms of identifying uh, the sort of percent, having control over knowing, oh, I can actually compute that optimal loss trigger as precisely as I like and know analytically that I've got well, however many decimal places you like. Um, okay, so here there actually is an optimal loss trigger for day 252 and it's 7.51% approximately. Um, Okay, so so what's I guess I guess there's kind of two points. Again, one is just this sort of conceptual point, which is oh, here there's an extreme barrier to reinvestment. So I hold cash for 21 days. In the presence of this extreme barrier to reinvestment, uh, I, I shouldn't. You know, the optimal policy again is trigger based, and there's some you know optimal trigger that I can calculate. That's the idea. Yes, I yeah. The question is, sure. I don't think anyone holds that cash. Reinvest, I tell Coke, buy Pepsi is sort of a favorite example. Yeah. So you just immediately pick up something similar. That's true. Um, sort of in the context of a more practical example of optimized tax loss harvesting with you know hundreds of securities and you're trying to find sort of risk equivalent securities. In a single trade, you still bump up against your risk limits. You say, "Oh, okay, I have, you know, I can, I can have, you know, th this particular trade. I'm no longer allowed to buy back this list of 100 securities that I sold. Now, if I want to trade inside the wash sale period, next 21 days, I essentially have a list of, let's say, it's the S and P 500. Maybe I have a list of 150 securities that I cannot buy back." Right. So there is a barrier to reinvestment. There is. Yeah. So for risk reasons, it's not that I'm completely barred from reinvesting, but I but there is a barrier for perfect reinvestment. And again, totally. the purpose of this talk isn't to argue that that these triggers are indicative of the actual triggers. It's just to make a conceptual point. As soon as there, that it's headed towards a conceptual point, which is as soon as there's any barrier to reinvestment. It should lead you in the direction of saying, oh, there's some uh, optimal policy that doesn't necessarily involve just continuous time trading or infinitely frequent trading. That's that's kind of the, the 
for, for people that are very interested in sort of practicalities, again, it's more of a conceptual point. It's yeah. interesting. I'm just wondering how it modifies in the presence of the fact that I could buy sell Pepsi and buy Coke. Well, even for Pepsi, there's a question. There's still a question. Uh, when should I sell Pepsi? So I have a position of Pepsi. I could sell Pepsi and buy Coke. Should I sell Pepsi and buy Coke? Should I sell it when I have, I don't know, a 10 cent loss? Like, would that be a good idea to do that? Totally yeah. Great question. And yeah. related question is how often should we be rebalancing these things? So there was just a case, an SAC case. Did you see that? I think it was Better Betterment. Than Slam. Yeah. Right. And they got, um, there was an, an interesting article by Matt Levine, which I think said something incorrect. Matt Levine said, so Betterment said they were harvesting every day and they were actually harvesting every other day. And Matt Levine said, well, they were not, they were fine because they deliver less to their clients, but he has no way of knowing that. He, they were fine because they did something they would they did one thing, said one thing and did another, which is a perfectly good reason to find them. Yeah. But I, I, I don't necessarily support the idea that they got less for that deception. Oh, <laughs> like the actual resolve. If yeah. they had done what they were saying, yeah. yeah. Now, that, that's a good question. I think. I sort of again, I, this has come up several times during this talk, and but I kind of I sort of suggest the beginning. The actual the actual process of tax loss harvesting involving baskets of hundreds or thousands of securities, it's very, very difficult to arrive at a conceptual understanding of what of what the things are that allow you to get more losses or better losses and make decisions around questions like how frequently should I tax harvest? There's been a line of research recently or 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 um, practitioner papers that suggest that basically more frequent tax har loss harvesting is better. And, and, and moreover, it, it sort of, although it's never explicitly stated, the idea is like, there's like no limit to this, like maybe intraday, like maybe I should do intraday monitoring and intraday trading. And really the point of this presentation is just to raise, is there any sort of conceptual mechanism that would put a, that would, put a stop to that and say, look, at some point, you're gonna reach a point where uh, there's certain fundamental barriers to how frequently you should loss harvest or, or that will could sort of talk about when you should loss harvest. And so that's really the, the angle that I'm focused on here. Again, it is very styles, but it's just to make a conceptual point. Oh, uh, really optimal policy should be more based around these triggers, number one. And number two, these triggers are not zero if there's a barrier to reinvestment. So we should send your paper to Matt and B because he said the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll we'll do that. All right. So um let's see how we're doing on time. We're we're going till 12 30. Well, we have until 12 30, yes. And we'd okay. like to have questions at the end. Okay, okay, good. So I want to do two things. Um I want to talk about uh um uh how, how do you you know what where does this analytical formula come from? Uh, that's interesting. Actually, very standard results in stochastic process theory give you this analytical formula, but I think those aren't necessarily familiar to folks in tax loss harvesting where they spend a lot of time th thinking about that. So I want to kind of go over that a little bit. There's a few slides on that. And then the other thing I want to talk about is finding this optimal point. Uh, and I think that's probably a little less well known and really the asymptotics of this optimal point. So I don't know. I mean, you see, will tell me, no, no, even that's still super well known, but but maybe not. So, um, so I'm not sure exactly how much time to spend to spend on this, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time because really, I have to say, every time that I've spent time thinking about how would I even make any progress at all in terms of this optimal exercise of this option, probably five times I've tried to make progress on this, and usually it just results with smoke pouring out of my ears and having absolutely no idea what to do. And so finally, here's a place where I feel like, oh, even though it's super stylized, we can do, we can say something, and I feel like it makes sense. So that's kind of the value of this part of my view. So um, great. So how, what is this formula? Um, so I'm going to just establish some notation here. So sigma is going to be the volatility of the log returns of the stock. So I'll just say the daily volatility of the log returns. Um, I'm going to express the trigger level. So far, I've told you the trigger level just in terms of the, the portfolio. Um, uh, percent losses on cost basis, but here I'm going to talk about which capital L. So L would be five percent in my story so far. I'm going to talk about the log losses instead. So just to make it super concrete, I'm going to introduce this guy lambda, which is log of one plus L. So it's just a simple transformation of the trigger. Um, 
Uh, one more thing that proves actually helpful is to actually talk about the trigger in terms of this of the volatility of the log returns. So lambda divided by sigma just turns out that's very convenient. So I'll call that z. So standardized values of things is usually denoted by z. That's what I'll talk about that. So the trigger level. Uh, and so then it's sort of in this notation, the expected log losses at elapsed time t is given by this formula, which I will this, I know it looks very maybe mysterious right now, a lot of notation, blizzard notation, but I'm just putting it up here so you can see, oh yeah, there's just a very concrete formula that will tell it to you in terms of these guys called each twiddle ends and whatever, whatever it's certain some of these times I don't want to, and one of these each twiddle ends, and again, I'll explain all this. Uh, this earth is the error function in statistics. Um, and um, this the appearance of this 21 over and over again, I decided to use 21. There's uh, 21 trading days in a month and 21 days is also the duration of the wash sale period. So just to remind myself, it's actually because it's the duration of the wash sale period. That's 21 business days. 21 trading days. Trading. Yeah, exactly. So that's why the number 21 is there. Later, we'll just turn that into a variable at, at the end of the talk. So, but anyway, that's for those that are, this is like a, sort of an article of religion. And it's like, yes, 21. There it is, 21. You can see where it is. Uh, okay, so this looks a little bit forbidding right now, but, but what I want to sort of convince you is that actually it's not that scary of a formula. Um, so, so now I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about some very, very standard results. But again, totally new to me. I'm not an expert in stochastic processes. Um, where does this one come from? So um, first hitting time. So first hitting time is an absolutely fundamental concept for stochastic processes. And the question is that it sort of answers is, um, what is the probability of hitting my 5% trigger sometime between a certain start time and a certain end time. So you can just pick your start time and your end time. And I, actually there's a very nice formula that just tells you, oh, your probability of hitting the trigger, the 5% loss trigger is, pick a number, 15%. It'll actually calculate it for you. And how do you do, what is the formula? Well, this has been solved as a solved problem. And so actually this little f of t is actually the PDF of those first hitting times. And so if you want to know the probability of first hitting in some time range, you just integrate this PDF from your start time to your end time. Um, and it turns out that this integral can be calculated using the error function just with some very easy u substitution calculus. So that's, you know, for somebody who's never done it before or somebody like me and then looking for the first time they want to try this, you'll see, oh yeah, I actually get it down to this integral. And so actually right away you see, oh, those horrible box, that horrible formula I showed you on the previous page. Oh my God, here it is oh, right away. We immediately are saying, oh yeah, the first hitting time from T0 to T1, probability of hitting that is given by, and there it is, just these error functions coming from the uh, PDF for the first hitting time. So that totally leads an amazingly cool story about why is that the formula for the first hitting time, but that would be, you know, we need somebody who's a course on statistical processes to explain to us where that comes from. Um, yeah. Was there, did somebody want to say something? Okay, so since um, this is my first time working with this, or I've only been through, I have to do, to make sure I understand all this correctly, I actually have to do on my computer in Python or whatever, a Monte Carlo simulation, and actually verify that I can predict these first hitting times. So what I've shown you here is, I actually did it, I said, oh, let me do 10,000 paths, 30% annualized volatility, 5% loss trigger. Let me just watch and see how, what day you hit the trigger. And I'll just say, oh, okay, uh, you know, on day three of my 10,000 paths is in blue. There was about, you know, 575 of the paths actually hit the trigger sometime on day three. And then if I go, what well, about day 14? Oh, the very first time, you know, 200 of the paths hit the trigger on day 14. So that's just straight from doing just a straight simulation. And then lo and behold, you can actually calculate and predict these frequencies using this formula. And lo and behold, you get this very, oh, wow, it's, you know, it's very close. If you use more paths, obviously, it gets closer. The formula is correct. Yeah. Uh, how did you arrive to f of t, like, before you computed This formula. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, that's a fundamental result in stochastic process theory. Okay. So, so that's, you know, that would be a great story. We don't have time for that. And I'm actually not the person to, to tell that story. <laughs> but probably of all the interesting things, that's probably the most interesting thing. Um, okay, great. So we actually can, can answer this question. This isn't exactly the qu question we have, but it feels like we're making some progress. Um, 
Uh, this is actually an old slide header. It turns out that this type of stochastic process is called a renewal process. And a renewal process, it's basically um, uh, every time an event happens and it's kind of like you're back to square one and the event happens and you're sort of like, oh, it's a new day and I'm going to sort of do the simulation from an day. Anyway, so uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So um, if we just start at time zero and integrate to t, that gives us the probability that the first thing time just occurs sometime in the first t days um, since I since I acquired this optimization. So for our log normal process, again, just it's a little bit of a simpler formula, just the first t day formulas instead of between time t1 and t2. Um, OK, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, here, I want to consider a related quantity, which is um, for a given sample path, I want to actually consider the function that just counts the number of trigger hits that happens by a certain last time. So, for example, by day 252, a certain path will have hit the trigger. Maybe the first month it hits the 5% trigger. Okay, you sell the ETF. You wait 21 days. You buy back the ETF. Maybe four months, more months goes by. Oh, now you hit the 5% trigger again. You've got another 5% loss beyond original. Okay, that's hit number two. Now you're five months in. Now maybe we go, we wait, we have to wait until month 11. And we another, now another, again, our portfolio has lost another 5%. That's trigger hit number three. And then we get to the end of the 12th month, the end of day 252, and we're done. That was three trigger hits. And I can actually tell you the losses in log, log space. It was 5%, log 5%, log 5%, log 5%. I know exactly what the log losses was for that for that path. So I can actually ask you, oh, okay, for each path by day, by day 252, maybe it hit four times, maybe it hit one time. What is, uh, I can just have that function that just counts those number of hits per path, okay? Um, I could compute that expected value, the expected number of hits by day 252, that's probably actually what you want to know. Um, how am I going to calculate that? Well, it would be nice if I just had a formula called H for hits that just tells you what's the probability of having precisely n hits on day t. So on day 20, on day 252, what's the probability of having precisely one hit? Oh, I'd actually know the realized losses if I knew it was precisely one hit. How about precisely 11 hits? How many? Okay. So then the expected log losses would just be a single log loss multiplied by, oh, the probability of having precisely n hits times the n hits, everyone gets to a log loss. So that's where this kind of expected log loss formula comes from. So really all you need to know is, yeah, what is the probability of having exactly uh, three trigger hits after 252 days? Um, and it turns out that those probabilities can be computed from the first hidden time CDF. Um, so that's kind of the, the strategy of deriving the formula. And, I, and I'll step through a little bit more of the math. Let me just pause there, though. Any, any questions on, on that? OK. Um, cool. So um, but this is a lot of formulas, uh, obviously. I guess uh, I'll just say that there's a, a trick to solving this now. And the trick is, first, you assume that there are no wash sale periods. So basically, you're just watching the price. As soon as you hit a trigger 5%, that's fine, but you just stay invested. Or you, if you like, you sell and you immediately buy back the position. So there's no wash sales, so that's totally fine. So then I can actually answer this question. Hey, what's the probability of having, um, of, of having um, N trigger hits? Like what's, what's the chance of having N trigger hits during the first 252 days? You can actually convert that to, What's the probability of first hitting a trigger of depth n times? So if it's five percent, I want to know what's I want three trigger hits. I can I can set say what's the first hitting time of a fifteen percent loss instead? Because I there's that's the only way I could hit a five percent trigger three times. I have to first hit when I first hit fifteen percent loss. And again, assuming that there's no wash sale here. So that's just the trick. To solving, that's like the key trick to solving this question about what if there are no watch sale periods, how do I derive these formulas? So, so that's fine. Um, and then the second observation is, oh, uh, can I derive these um, precisely end hit formulas from the CDF? And then this, this uh, box right here sort of tells you to do it. Well, if it's precisely, uh, sorry, at least, the first thing time for at least, call it three hits, uh, what does that mean? It means 
by, by the 252 say it means, well, I got precisely three hits by day 52, or I got precisely four hits by day 52, or I got precisely five hits by, by day 252. That will mean that I got uh, my first hitting time of three hits occurred sometime between day zero and day 252. So that's that's pretty neat. You get this infinite telescoping series, and then you can just use this old trick of, of infinite cancellation to actually derive the, the precisely say three trigger hits in terms of the CVS just by taking the difference. So that's a neat trick. I didn't make up the trick. It's very standard development. And thanks to, to Steve for sort of pointing me towards this formula. Um, cool. So so in the case of long door more trends actually gives us the, this question of probability precisely in trigger hits at time without wash sales. Uh, again, we're, we're starting to see something that looks like uh, the really kind of wild formula in our first box. So again, um, folks can, you know, they can look at this at their leisure. Um, cool. So again, this is just me checking that this formula really works. So again, I just did these simulations and I just sort of counted, oh, I'm A52. Uh, how many paths had zero hit? This is 10,000 paths. There were, you know, 1,400 paths had zero hits. So maybe they went up or just never got low enough. Uh, whatever it is, 1,300 paths got one precisely one hit and so forth, and just checking that that formula actually works. Um, okay. Um, here's the part that, that often has stymied me, but here is just a very nice way around it, which is, okay, how do you jam wash sales into this sort of distribution of trigger hits and the frequency of trigger hits? So um, it's actually um, not so bad. Um, you, just a very slight change in the point of view. Um, what is this FNT? It's the CDF of the time uh, of the nth trigger hit. So it really, if you think about the time between trigger hits, and this is sometimes in stochastic this, this is called inter-arrival times. If you want to look this up, look up the keyword inter-arrival times. The idea is the time, it's like a, um, this is like a, the independent draws of this first hitting time distribution. So like, oh, the first trigger hit is one draw from the first hitting time distribution. And I get, oh, it was, I don't know, 30 days until the first trigger hit. Now, how about the next one? Oh, it was only 15 days until the next one. How about the next one? Oh, it was six months. That's what these XTs are. And you just say, oh, okay, the first time of the, the N trigger hit is TN. Um, and so what you can say is, oh, well, with watch sales, you have the same idea. It's just every time I hit the trigger, I have to wait an additional 21 days before I get to restart my process. So these, these twiddles, this is the distribution of the um, of the end trigger hit with wash sales. And uh, you can see, oh, these are the inner arrival times with wash sales, but they're just the inner arrival times when you're actually invested, plus an extra 21 days of this sort of waiting period while you're holding cash. So you actually get, oh, the distribution of this end trigger hit CDF is actually the 21 times the number of trigger hits, plus this is the no wash sale version. So that's just a little trick. Um, and so you get the CDF of the um, end trigger hit with wash sales. It's literally just the CDF without wash sales that you have to translate the time and actually back it up by a certain number of triggers. So if you imagine you're talking about like, um, like suppose I want to know this with CDF with wash sales for day, I don't know, uh, 40. Well, I'd have to subtract, and I want oh, the first trigger hit. Well, I subtract 21 days from 40, I get 19. And I say, okay, I have one trigger hit in the first 19 days. But then anytime I have that, I have a watch, I have I just sit there holding cash and can't have any further trigger hits. So that, that's why you have this sort of compression or this translation of the, of the time. Period. And then FN is zero days. Anyway, um, probably again for the succinct thing, you have to think a little bit more about it, but you can incorporate the watch still in that. So um, anyway, applying this kind of chain of reasoning, I know we're kind of getting a little bit deeply into this. This allows you to change the times that were in the part without wash sales to these special offsets of the time axis, depending on the number of trigger hits with wash sales. So that's the appearance of the 21. That's how that gets in there. Again, probably better to sit down and walk through the algebra yourself. Um, let me just pause um, in case uh, folks have sort of questions where I can clarify anything. that. I, again, I know the exact one of the time is simple. Okay, cool. So, so um, again, this is supposed to tell you with with having a wash sale period implemented, um, what is the uh, probability of having precisely 
pick a number, five trigger hits in the first 252 days. And so we have an analytical formula for that frequency using the formulas we just went over, and you can do it in simulation. You can see now the, the bars are starting to assume a kind of a wild shape. You can see these bars actually creep up a little bit at the beginning before dropping off. That's kind of interesting. The blue bars don't exactly do that. Actually, if you use more paths, they, they would fall in very closely. So uh, yeah, really, really, really can predict the outcome of simulations. This is, I actually like this bottom plot the most, and this is the most beautiful plot of the presentation. This is actually over time, it's the predicted frequency of a certain number of trigger hits. So you can see, you know, at time zero, uh, we have a 100% chance of having zero trigger hits. Um, by day 50, we've got, you know, a, a certain, uh, whatever it is, I don't know, 30% probability of having no trigger hits, or 40% probability of having one trigger hit, 35% uh, probability of two. And then that's it. Because of wash sales, you can't have more than two in the first, you know, whatever it was, 50 days. Or more than three, I should say. So this is really, this, I don't know, unbelievably beautiful plot to me. Um, cool. Um, okay, so I'll even, let me just pause there. So that lets you, since we know the formula for those H's, we can figure out the expected number of trigger hits at time T, so that gets us the expected log losses at time T. We can plot you know, the air function, you know, everything. We can plot for any trigger your expected log losses. Okay. So let me just go back actually for, well, let me just go back. Yeah. Uh, it should be really easy to find the bottom of this because I have a formula for the y coordinate in terms of the x coordinate. Uh, I should just be able to take the derivative and set it equal to zero and find the, the, the minimum. I can't do it. So maybe somebody here is very clever. And remember, there's like error function in here, and you take the derivative, and you get e to the minus x squared, and it's very messy. Did you ask ChatGPT? I did not ask ChatGPT. That's we'll try that next. We'll try that next. Um, so the minimum here, again, I kind of already emphasized this. It was found numerically. I still think it's valid, like conceptually, kind of to be like honest. It's it's valid because it's all analytical. So I have total bounds on everything. So I can, I can know that I have this point as precisely as you want. I still think we can do better though. So the goal for the last, I guess, um, maybe 10 minutes here is to talk about uh, what can you tell you mathematically about what this trigger is just in terms of the parameters of the volatility and the trigger depth. Okay, so um, here's one thing that's interesting. We've been focusing a lot on this first year, and we said a 30% stock volatility, the optimal trigger for 250, uh, 252 days is minus 7.51. It took me a long time to realize this. I just sort of thought, oh, there's kind of a trigger, and a year's long enough. The graph kind of has these funny little kinks at the beginning, but surely everything's kind of okay by 2, 252. But that's not true. So here I actually look at 100 years of elapsed time instead of one year, and I do the exact same thing. I make the plot, I locate the minimum. Now the optimal loss trigger is minus 8.19% instead of here with 7.51. So uh, that's a little annoying, first of all. Um, but actually, it turns out it's not so bad. So I have to convince you that. So uh, I want to convince you that it's not so bad that that changed. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to talk about symmetries of the simulated portfolio histories. Yeah. So I was wondering if like the optimal loss trigger changes when you change the time that's elapsed, but because like you file taxes on an annual basis, I don't think it really matters. So, so again, uh, here we're actually assuming that your um, tax savings like accrue the moment that you realize the losses. And you are correct. In reality, they don't actually accrue until, you know, you finally have to write that check. In fact, it's probably even in April the 15th or whatever of the next year. So again, that's a real life deviation and you're absolutely right. Again, really what we're sort of aiming for here is more of a conceptual point, which is, uh, when there's a barrier to reinvestment, is there something that, what, what can we say anything about the optimal policy? Um, and then the argument we're putting here is, oh, the optimal policy means there's some kind of like loss, loss depth trigger. You shouldn't just realize losses instantaneously. There's any barrier. Um, but anyway, that's a good point. Okay, so, so there's a lot of stuff on here. Um, if you think about it, here's how I'm thinking about it. We've got this, so let me go back to the beginning of the, of the, 
the talk. This guy, this plot. Um, I, instead of writing dollars here, I could write pennies. And this would turn into 60, this would turn into 70, this would turn to 80. Everything would look the same though. The actual, the actual op, the, the, the realized losses would be the same. Everything would be the same, right? Instead of writing days here, again, I'm going to keep the actual graphics the exact same. Uh, I could write months. If I just write months. It's still true that every time this the uh, that I realize losses, I've lost I have an unrealized loss of five percent. It didn't matter that I wrote months. Okay, so this plot, this graphical plot, is actually invariant under two types of scaling. One is rescaling the, the, the horizontal axis, and you can think about that as, as pre-multiplying the time dimension by a constant. And it's also invariant by rescaling the vertical axis. And if you want, you can think about that rescaling the, um, the log prices, multiplying those by a constant. So that's actually a very powerful idea, it turns out. And so now I'll go back to, um, to this slide. So. So what does that mean? Um, it means something about the frequency. So I've got these functions that say, oh, what's the frequency of the probability of precisely n hits at a certain time? So if you just use the formula for this, so we have the exact formula, you can see that, oh, if I just change, suppose I multiply sigma by 10, I use 10 times the volatility. Okay, so I multiply sigma by 10. Well, suppose I multiply lambda by 10 also. Well, my claim is that the probability of n trigger hits is unchanged if I do this. So if I do 10 times the volatility, I would, I, and I do 10 times the loss depth trigger, actually the frequency of hitting the, the, um, the trigger is unchanged, of getting precisely three hits, precisely four hits. The reason for that is remember these formulas for precisely n hit probabilities, actually the function of the ratio of the trigger depth divided by the volatility. But I just multiply both of these numbers by 10, this variable z doesn't change them. That's pretty straightforward. This, this is basically the multiplication of price symmetry that I just talked about. Because if I multiply the, the axis by 10, the, the y-axis, that's the same thing as I now look at the volatility, it's been multiplied by 10. OK, cool. What does that mean about the optimal trigger? It means if I multiply the volatility by 10, you can actually just check this. Oh, actually, I multiply the optimal trigger by 10 also. Seems that's what happens to the optimal trigger. Um, Okay, that's pretty cool. What about the time scaling? Well, the time scaling, I remember I've got this 21 day wash sale period. So when I when I scale that time axis, I'm actually gonna be changing the duration of the wash sale period. Like if I multiply the time axis by different numbers. So here I represent the duration of the wash sale period by tau. And I sort of ask what happens if I multiply the wash sale period and make it longer or shorter by scaling, then I'm scaling the time axis. Well, it turns out if you don't want these H's to change, and again, you can just go straight back to the formula, if you root k scale the trigger and you multiply the time by k, actually those frequencies won't change. And so you get a transformation law. Oh, if I change the duration of the wash sale period, the optimal trigger gets scaled. So anyway, you can just check this directly with the point. So anyway, those are very powerful. The implications are if you actually know the optimal trigger for a certain choice of sigma and tau, the volatility and the trigger, and t, you can actually find it for any other choice of sigma and tau just by using these op these, these two laws. You can just factor the sigma and the tau out. So you get sigma times root uh, tau times whatever the optimal trigger is for one one at this time. So, so actually, you only have to solve the optimal trigger for one choice of sigma and tau by, by this rule. OK, I'm going to just continue to work with this 30% annualized volatility in 21 day wash sale period. And I'm just going to ask, how does the optimal trigger for that case, just because we've been spending some time on it. Um, so here's a really funny graph. Um, so th this is it. I, I, we did it for a huge range of times. We actually did it from below a tenth of a day all the way out to, you know, millennia, you know, thousand millennia or whatever. Um, and I just calculate that optimal trigger just over and over and over. So yeah, each one of these dots is found numerically by finding the bottom. And blah blah blah. So, yeah, look at this. You think I made a coding error there? Yeah. I think again, this has to do with the point. Well, the location of this has to do with the twenty-one days, the, du the duration of the, the actual twenty-one days that was used. The thing I want to point out is this asymptote, negative eight point two five percent. 
Okay, so I told you, oh, when I used one year, it was minus seven point whatever. And then when I used 100 years, it was minus 8.19. And now it's minus 8.25. Okay, so, so my claim here is that, oh, that's actually a really cool number to, to know. And um, I know it doesn't look like it, but that's actually a very special number. So I'm going to tell you why this is a special number. Here's the thing. Um, again, scaling the laws uh, to generate the plot are the same regardless of how we choose to measure time. The optimal trigger doesn't care about whether I measure time in months or days. And so in particular, we figured out the optimal trigger, these all these optimal triggers using um, these measured at daily horizons. So tau is 21, sigma was whatever the daily horizon volatility is. We can change everything to monthly. If we change everything to monthly, volatility goes to sigma times root 21. That's standard, it's very standard root T scaling. 21 days in a month. So tau turns into one month. Okay, and then the time goes from days to t divided by 21 months. Okay, those optimal triggers are the same. It's really important here, tau is one now. Okay, so tau is one. My claim is we've got this long run optimal trigger of 8.25%. For this tau, tau of one and the volatilities that we use. Uh, what's the that's that's actually the actual loss. The log loss is negative 8.61%. And again, just there with you know, this is things a bit weird. Um, something I skipped over, you have to be able, you have to know formulas to convert back and forth between um, annualized volatility of returns to volatility of log returns. Right, because we're working in log return space. So it's not the same number, it's a slightly different number. Yeah, it turns out this is the transformation. So the volatility of 30% or 0.3, the sigma you use is actually, so this might look a little bit weird, but there's, you know, you can derive this, this transformation yourself. That's a side topic. So that's the sigma that you actually would use. Um, I'm gonna use the monthly volatility sigma. So that's why I took the volatility divided by square root of 12. To compute the monthly horizon volatility. To do this calculation, minus uh, plus 8.61%. Oh, the optimal long run optimal trigger was minus 8.61%. So what we say here is, oh, actually, this long run optimal trigger is actually just the volatility, just just the negative of the volatility. This is a conjecture. I didn't prove it. I just drew. I did a plot. But, but we do know that, that if it was true in this example, because of all these transformation rules, it's actually, that's that's the answer. That's the answer. The support completely inverse. <laughs> yes, yeah, totally, yeah, exactly. And it turns out because of the shape of these plots, actually, um, uh, when you're too shallow, your log losses fall off very quickly. But being having too deep of a trigger, it's like they fall off very slowly. So it's, actually, it's not too bad to use this long run trigger even if it's not really right for 252 days. So it's, it's a little bit off. But if you went too low, you're like, oh, my log losses are going to drop off. Okay. So uh, again, bottom line, it's a totally stylized model. There's a lot of deviations from reality. But again, just trying to make this main point that, oh, there actually is an optimal trigger when this barrier to investment here, a very severe barrier to investment. And uh, uh, all, the other thing you can get from this is that is the limit as um, the limit as um, as uh, you basically can recover this thing that you should uh, continuously realize losses as the um, as the um, uh, wash sale period goes to zero. Yeah, as the wash. Sale. Anyway, let me just stop there. So um, yeah, that's 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 what we know about this stylized model. Do we have any more questions from the room? Or person? Yeah. So if you were to change the volatility value, uh, does it seem like the conjecture still holds? Yeah, so the reason why this is a completely general conjecture, so we derive this conjecture just from looking at this one case of volatility 30% and a 5% trigger. So let's say that it's true for this case, like, oh, okay, fine, Are you convinced me, uh, maybe I proved it, oh yeah, it really is minus 8.61%. The nice part is because of these scaling laws, I actually can get any other, uh, I can get any other um, wash sale period duration and volatility of the underlier just by literally the answer is, oh, like what is the trigger of the longer trigger? It's this. It's literally sigma times square root of tau. That's it. That's the long run trigger. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions from Zoom audience? 
Uh, if not, we have one oh, yeah, non-remote yeah, question. I have a question on slide 14 and 18. Slide which? Slide 14, where is the first Monte Carlo simulation? The very first one? Yeah. Well, slide 4. 14. 14, 14, 14 thank you. I think 13, then. The, yeah. So the, the plot about the Monte Carlo simulation is basically the number of hitting time it hits on the X axis and how many parts do that hit on the Y axis, right? What this one is, is we're looking at first hitting times. So we just asked the question, uh, how we did 10,000 paths. Of those 10,000, how many first hit the trigger on day five? But for the very first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how many first hit the trigger on day four? The, the nice part about that question is that there's a very slick answer from stochastic process theory. And once you know the answer, you can actually do a little bit of math as we do on the previous slide to answer the question, this more directly relevant question, what's the probability of having precisely three hits on day four, precisely four hits on day five? Yeah. yeah. And is there a reason why it is decreasing as the day as possible? Yeah, so it's the, first, it's the first hitting time, right? So the idea is, thank you, Siri. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just think about all these paths. A lot of them never hit. Like half of them just sort of go, like the stock price just goes up and it never hits. Those ones are going to be like way out here. The first, like, it's like, oh, they didn't hit on day 500. They didn't hit it. Like they just go forever. Right. Some of them, you just had a very large downward hop, like right away. Very small number of them hit on day one. So this is just chopped off just because I didn't, there wasn't, I, I probably shouldn't have stopped at day 21 here because it sort of suggests that I needed to watch silver. So it doesn't. It's just going to continue the trail off here. Yeah. Be really fun to look at this with more realistic assumptions of what stocks actually do. So cross sectionally, at least, right? We know that most stocks tank relative to an index. Few high flyers, lots of lots of losers, and so if we were to take into account, I know this is going to sink the stock, but yeah, that had to do it for a large group. So that I'm pointing to this Israel of Lou paper. What's that thing called? Like called optimal tax loss servicing or something like that. I can send you the exact. Those guys have a new company in Boston. You know them. I do know them, and I don't think it's a mistake that the president of the company was the previous head of volatility risk premium for AQR. Yeah. Someone who's very in touch with options mm -hmm. in the way they think about things. Yeah. So the original work on loss harvesting was all option based. But the original work that I know of comes to the 80s from the 1980s. There's old papers. Yeah. So. Exactly. So the pretty much uh, actually that's the I don't know. I, I should be curious if there are papers since the eighties, but it's one of the first papers. And what he assumes there is yearly loss harvesting and perfect substitutes. Um, so and he says, oh, uh, realize any loss immediately. Yeah. So that's that's the limit. That's the limit as the watch period goes to zero. Well, this is obviously uh, very relevant to the developments. <laughs> I just have another clarifying question. In the watch sale period, are we, uh, is there a barrier to just not investing in exactly same securities, or is it just like a pool of similar securities that is the same industry or something? Definitely. So in fact, applications, and this is kind of several times already thought, they're so-called in the in Constantinides, he'll say risk equivalent security. So it's a security where the idea is, oh, the um, return distribution is identical, but from an IRS perspective, it's not identical, it's not substantially identical. So you're allowed to reinvest. And this is kind of like this Coke versus Pepsi question that, that Lisa was raising. This is a very money question debated all in long by tax economists. Pretty interesting. You know what be you know, a fun place to look into this sort of thing is um, I think it's long wanted to do this on cryptocurrency. So there's no wash sale rule. So you can basically, in theory, just have the return stream of cryptocurrency if you want such a thing, plus all the losses that you can get instantaneously, but there's probably operational impediments to being able to do that with the close to continuous time. Mm. But uh, of course, once Oh, I see. So you're saying, oh, because of even just operational impediments, you have an effective cow. Well, maybe a little one. Yeah. Or maybe, I, I don't know anything about cryptocurrency, not a lot of Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense. This is the constant thing of saying, 
We have an optimization in general. We want to avoid de minimis trades. Yeah. This is a, this is a sort of a core concept. Yeah. I think what this does is, at least in my mind, it sort of clarifies that there's a role for a de minimis loss and therefore puts kind of puts the brakes on just saying we're just gonna trade your portfolio in real time. Um, I, I'm all in yeah. favor of any of that that literature. There's another kind of question, which is imagine some sort of round um, generalization of this sort of thing, because you really want to look at long horizons with reinvestment and all the complication of what we do. So I, I haven't done this exercise, it's really beautiful, but we do like a more stupid exercise by just trying to run loss harvesting the way we do it through historical periods with reinvestment assumptions of different kinds and stuff. You, and the wash sale, all the realism, you, you find that more frequent isn't better. I agree. It, even with all that complexity, we found it dozens of times. It's kind of galling to see all the claims to the contrary that have absolutely no support. Yeah. We'll just say it. I think it's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, some something that 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 I've kind of written about a little bit you know, commercially is just the, the concept of again, you might have a one penny loss on a stock, one cent, uh -huh. but so you could do it right then and you would get the one penny, or you could wait. And what's on the downside? The downside of waiting is you lose the penny, but the upside of waiting is potentially a much more substantial, much more substantial realized loss. So again, that's just the optional, but I just show it using, again, it's just, it's just pure simulation and no, there's sort of no structural model. Right. And also a, a nice generalization that might actually be accessible is about the two tax rates. Yeah, the two tax, so constantly he talks about the two tax rates and a lot of many people have written about this tax arbitrage. And there, I don't know, um, again, I don't know how the sort of concept of barrier to reinvestment sort of figures in there. I mean, I'm sure, obviously, if you could come down from the heavens and write down the perfect formula and tell you the optimal policy, certainly all of the variables would be in there. But it's just that I don't think right now there's just a very poor conceptual understanding of the dependence of the optimal policy on how these variables change. Anyway, okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Okay, hey, this time uh, next week, uh, Gary, uh, uh, bear with me for a second, King. Uh, uh, will be the final seminar of the year. Uh, and of course, Gary, uh, Ms. Anseth from Bloomberg is going to be joining us. Uh, he'll be here in person. Hope to see you as many as possible. Uh, please come. The seminars. It's so much fun to have everyone in the room. See you next week. That was great. You look for nothing. This is it. This was my first. Uh, we posted slide. Yes. We